Murder is typically not the first crime committed by the perpetrator. They'll normally have worked their way up to it, with murder being the culmination of a series of previous attacks. Therefore, it's pretty rare to have someone suspected of killing two people, getting away with it both times, and then killing a third, and finally being convicted. In this episode, we're looking at Mark Schillerbeer. He killed 18-year-old Rebecca Storrs in 1999, but he was also suspected of having killed two people in 1996 and 1997. He got away with both, and they remain unsolved to this date. Keep listening to hear more about this fascinating case that occurred in the South Wales town of Bridgend. You are now listening to British Brothers, the True Cry Podcast. Hello everyone and welcome to British Murders, the podcast that focuses exclusively on British murder cases with an occasional glimpse at horror movies. I don't do that too much anymore. I'm your host Stuart Blues and this is the second episode of season seven. This week's case was suggested by Patreon member Kerry Lloyd. We're in the town of Bridgend this week, which is located in Bridgend County Borough, South East Wales. Let me quickly advise you that this podcast contains elements that may be alarming to some listeners. As always, listener discretion is advised. Our villain this week has a rather unusual surname. It's spelled S-H-I-L-L-I-B-I-E-R. Instantly, I thought it must have had French origins, as in Chilibier. However, a quick online search suggests it may be one of many variations of the English surname Chilibier which has medieval origins. To top it off, our villain's first name is Mark with a C, which itself is a red flag. My apologies to any Marks with a C listening, or Karks, if you will. I'm going to go with Shillibeer for his name, so let's go with that. Mark Shillibeer was born in 1968, and as with many cases I cover on here that have minimal exposure, information on his background and early life was hard to come by. Luckily, case suggester Kerry kindly provided me with some of her memories of Mark as a kid, as she grew up with him. When he was just a nipper, Mark's parents placed him in the full-time care of his grandparents, Megan and Ivor. They live next door to Kerry, so it's fair to say she's a reliable source. Mark's dad was a lorry driver, and on occasion he did visit his son at the house on St. Tellio's Road in Bridgend, but it seems to have been a visit he made on his own. It doesn't sound like Mark's mum wanted anything to do with him, as she was rarely seen visiting her son. Therefore, not much is known about her. Mark attended Brintirian Comprehensive School, and by all accounts, he was a bit of a troublemaker. His elderly grandparents did their best to instill some discipline into their rebellious grandson, but their attempts were often greeted with mockery and laughter. A perfect example would be when they tried to ground Mark for behaving badly. He would simply walk out of the house laughing his head off, knowing there was nothing his grandparents could do about it. When he was a teenager, Mark decided to expose himself to two young girls walking past his bedroom window. The girls ran away terrified and told their mother about what had happened, even though they likely didn't fully comprehend the severity of it. To protect her girls from any further potential trauma that a trial could have brought, their mum opted to forget about the incident, and in the end did not press charges despite informing the police. As an adult, Mark got married at some point, and the couple even had two kids, but they ended up divorced. He does appear to have held some forms of proper employment, such as time spent as a fishmonger, but as with most things in his life, nothing ever lasted too long. He eventually transitioned into becoming a part of the criminal underworld, with b**** being the main one of many pies he had his fingers in. Whilst incarcerated in 2003, Mark would say, Yes, I sold drugs. I beat people up. I kicked doors in. I have had my fingers in many pies, but I did not commit murder. Perhaps he was a thug for hire too? Mark has lived all over the UK, but originally he was from Bridgend. Throughout this episode, I will tell you the story of three murders. Each has been linked to Mark Schillerbeer, but he has only been found guilty of committing one. Our first timeline is the shortest and starts on February 9th, 1997. On that Sunday evening, the local fire service was called to a flat on St. James's Square in the Roman city of Bath in Somerset, southwest England. The firefighters were greeted by billowing black smoke coming from a flat, and they used all their guile to extinguish the blaze whilst preventing anyone from getting hurt. Anyone apart from the poor sole occupant inside the flat who had succumbed to the fire. At least, that's what they thought had caused the man's death. 
It would later be revealed that the badly burned body recovered from the decimated flat belonged to 45-year-old Kevin Moyidin, the son of former mayor of Bath, John James Malloy. I alluded to the fire not being the cause of Kevin's death. Here's why. His body was found kneeling with a knife lodged firmly in his back. A post-mortem later revealed that his neck was also broken. It looked like the fire was a case of arson rather than a disastrous accident, with Kevin's killer likely wanting to destroy any evidence by setting the entire place ablaze. Nine days after discovering Kevin's body, a £5,000 reward was offered by a local newspaper in the hope that someone would come forward with any information that could lead to the capture of his killer. There's a gap missing here about how and why it came to be, but Mark Shillibier ended up being arrested on suspicion of Kevin's murder and was ultimately charged with it. He explained what may have happened when his trial started at Bristol Crown Court in October 1998. Mark's friend explained that on the night of February 9th, they had met up with Kevin and ended up at his flat. His testimony stated that Mark and Kevin disappeared into a bedroom and had sex. As he waited patiently in the living room, the friend recalled Mark exiting the bedroom and declaring with little emotion, I have killed him. Kevin had been savagely beaten, struggled and stabbed after he and Mark had had sex. The defendant insisted that story was inaccurate, however. Mark told the jury that on the night in question, he was as high as a kite 30 odd miles away in the seaside town of Western Supermare. That was where he lived at the time of the murder. The jury must have believed his testimony because at the end of the nine day trial on October 23rd, 1998, they came back with a verdict of not guilty regarding the murder of Kevin Muyidin. Kevin's murder remains unsolved to this day. However, his father is certain that Mark was the man responsible for ending his son's life. He would go on to say, I will always be convinced that he killed my son. Absolutely nothing will convince me otherwise. After being cleared of murder, Mark moved 160 miles away from his then home in the Plymouth parish of Stoke to his native Bridgend. At some point he appears to have spent some time living in Loo, a coastal town in southeast Cornwall, but the nomad always seemed to end up back in his hometown. Our second timeline began on Friday, March 5th, 1999. Let me introduce an 18-year-old art student named Rebecca Storrs, who lived at Westminster Way in Bridgend. Known to her close friends and family as Becky, Rebecca was an extremely talented artist. Her creative personality would have undoubtedly seen her excel at university had she had the chance to achieve her dream of studying for an art degree. Like Mark Shillibier, Rebecca attended Brintirian Comprehensive School and was studying for her A-level exams in art and English, which were due to be taken that summer. Living with Rebecca in the terraced house was her mother, Elizabeth, her older sister, Victoria, who was 21, and her younger sister, Laura, who was 13. Michael Storrs, Rebecca's father, lived in the historic county of Sussex at the time. One assumes Michael and Elizabeth had separated at some point. However, Michael still seems to have been involved in his daughter's lives. Michael described Rebecca as a beautiful, modern girl who loved life, was intelligent, and also fun-loving. Art wasn't the only creative outlet Rebecca excelled at. She was a skilled poet and spent some free time fine-tuning her guitar playing skills. She was proficient at everything she tried. On that chilly Friday evening, Rebecca and Victoria had planned a night on the town. Leaving the house at around 9.30pm, the sisters made the Three Horseshoes pub their first stop. Once they'd put the world to rights and had a few beverages along the way, Rebecca and Victoria made their way to a second establishment, which was either another pub or a nightclub, depending on which source you believe. I'm tempted to say it was a nightclub, as they were out until the early hours. At around 2am the following morning, Saturday March 6th, Rebecca met up with some people at one of the town's busy kebab shops. It's not clear whether Rebecca knew who they were, or if they just started chatting in the queue whilst waiting for their food, but regardless, the group explained that they were going to a house party for the afters. The invitation had come from a 20-year-old woman I don't think any of them knew. The party was back at her house on the Wild Mill Estate, not too far away, so Rebecca figured she might as well join them, as she wasn't ready for the night to end. Being the responsible young woman she was, Rebecca made sure to call the house to let someone know what her plans were. The phone was answered by her younger sister Laura, who likely planned on passing the message to their mum later that morning when she woke up. Putting the pieces together, we have to assume that Victoria had already called it a night at that point and made her way home to bed, because Rebecca tagged along to the house party on her own. Here's the thing though, there was no house party. Not really. 
With the 20-year-old woman who had invited them was her mother and three strange men, one of whom was the then 31-year-old Mark Shillibeer. One of the partygoers in the group that had told Rebecca of the house party invitation later said, There was only the girl from the club, her mother and three men, but nothing to drink, not even coffee and not much conversation. Understandably, Rebecca didn't stay for too long at the house and was seen leaving at around 4am. Sadly, that was the last time she was seen alive. A neighbour who lived opposite the banks of the River Ogmore recalled hearing the voice of a woman followed by what sounded like the piercing scream of someone in distress at 4.30am, half an hour after Rebecca left the party. That scream likely came from Rebecca Storrs as she was being attacked by the man who would murder her a short while later. A few hours after that scream was heard, Mark Shillibeer knocked on the house door where the supposed party had been held earlier that morning. The 20-year-old woman who'd invited everyone to the house answered the door at some point between 6 and 7am and it was a smartly dressed Mark Shillibeer who was on the other side. She said he had just come out of the shower. He told me he had done something stupid and needed help. He said he had had sex with someone and killed someone. He said if I went to the cops, I would be next. The part about him having a shower strikes me as odd, but Mark's hair was wet, so maybe she assumed he had showered before knocking on her door. Mark was living with his friend and his friend's mum back then, and based on their accounts of what happened that morning, Mark doesn't appear to have nipped home for a shower. Adrian Jones recalled waking up at around 8am that Saturday morning and noticing that Mark hadn't returned home after his night out. The next time he saw his lodger was after 8am, but before 11am, when he finally returned home. That three-hour window might seem broad, but it's not clear when Mark returned home. I say before 11am for a reason, which I'll come to soon. Adrian said, I asked him where he had been, and he said he had slept in the car because he didn't want to wake my mother and me when he came in. Mark said to me, remind me to get my coat out of the car. It was soaking wet last night. So if Mark hadn't had a shower and it was raining the night before and a scream was heard near the banks of the River Ogden, I'm sure he can start to piece together this mystery. Mark Shillibeer would continuously deny having any involvement with the murder of Rebecca Storrs, even after he was convicted of it, but here's how most believe the chain of events occurred. Rebecca left the party at around 4am, as I mentioned earlier, but she was not alone. She may have left the party with Mark, but I think it's more likely that he followed her without her initially being aware of his presence. At some point, Mark must have spoken to Rebecca because he led her to an area behind a local book of wholesalers. According to a former girlfriend of Mark's, that spot was his go-to when making advances on women. She had been taken to that same spot back in 1989. Rebecca rejected Mark's advances and made it abundantly clear she was not interested in him that way. Angered by the refusal, Mark attacked Rebecca with what most reports believe to be a hammer and a Stanley knife. He also subjected her to a sexual assault before striking her to death. The 18-year-old had done her very best to fight back against her killer, as the police would later confirm that there were what they called signs of violence, but Mark managed to overpower her. Rebecca's body was then haphazardly thrown into the nearby river by her killer, who then walked off. I mentioned 11am earlier by saying that Mark arrived at his lodgings before then. I said that because Rebecca's body was discovered between 11 and 11.30am that morning, and Mark was confirmed as being at home before that discovery was made. A man was walking his dog along the riverbank and spotted a suspicious looking object in the water. The concerned citizen phoned the police, who arrived at the scene minutes later and confirmed that it was the body of a woman. Rebecca was found half submerged in the river, face down. A quick check of the nearby riverbank revealed numerous bloodstains, indicating that this was not a tragic accident. A murder investigation was launched with the first port of call being door-to-door -door inquiries. The 50-strong team of officers knocked on every door in the local area of Wildmill and questioned everyone who answered. Meanwhile, the riverbanks were being scrupulously searched by forensic teams in the hope of gathering vital evidence. Frustratingly, apart from the bloodstains, any evidence that may have helped their inquiry was likely washed away by the river. As Rebecca's body was recovered, police had three theories of how she may have died. The first was that she may have been sh the second was that she may have drowned, and the third was that she may have succumbed to hypothermia. They even suggested it may have been a combination of all three. Before long, the police were knocking on the door of the house party property, and they were told about the gathering earlier that morning. They were given the names of the people there, including Mark Shillibeer, so naturally they ended up at his door too. Within three days of discovering Rebecca Storrs' body, Mark was arrested and taken in for questioning. 
He wasn't being charged with anything at that point, as the police had no evidence against him, but he was certainly a key person of interest, as he was one of the last people to see Rebecca alive. Perhaps someone else at the party told the police that they saw him leave either with Rebecca or shortly after her. Mark was interviewed for three days, and the police even requested he be held for longer, but the local magistrates turned down their appeal. They clearly held concerns regarding what Mark was telling them, but once their time was up, they had to let him go. Rather than keeping a low profile, Mark decided to confess what he had done to one of his friends after he was released from police custody. The friend said, he said no at first, but then, yes I killed her. She was still breathing when I left her. I asked him why, and he said, I don't know why. I gutted her like a fish. Not knowing they had just released Rebecca's killer, the police organised for posters to be placed all around Bridge End, which detailed the last known movements of Rebecca and implored anyone who knew anything to come forward. BBC's Crime Watch was also contacted and appealed for information on their show. Police's next person of interest was described as a man with ginger hair. He was one of the other two men that attended the house party with Mark Shillibeer. An initial £10,000 reward was bumped up to £20,000, but nothing came of it. Mark's friend decided to inform the police of his confession and explained to them that Mark had said he'd buried a yellow and black handled screwdriver close by to where Rebecca's body was found. Their searches of the riverbanks led to police finding a hammer a hundred yards downstream from the crime scene, but it's not clear as to whether that was the murder weapon or not. By May 1999, two months after the dog walker's discovery, the 50-strong police squad had interviewed 2,000 people, took 1,200 statements, visited 1,600 homes, and seized 1,700 exhibits. Despite all that effort, all roads led back to Mark Shillibier. Officers seized Mark's car and a thorough search of the inside was conducted. In the boot, they found some tools, including a claw hammer. They also found some items of clothing and a cigarette butt. That last item was what tied Mark Shillibier to Rebecca Storrs. The cigarette butt had her DNA on it, which placed her inside Mark's car. The police finally had their missing link. Mark was arrested again on either May 18th or 19th, 1999, and this time he was charged with the murder of Rebecca Storrs. When questioned, Mark admitted that he had smoked a cigarette in his car with a woman that evening, but insisted he had no idea who she was. In an attempt to harm the character of Rebecca and distance himself from the crime, Mark explained that the woman he had in his car that morning was scruffy looking and didn't resemble the photos of Rebecca shown to him by the police. He also said she was wearing army surplus clothing, which was absolute nonsense. The final attempt to worm his way out of things was to blame the gingerhead man police were said to be looking to question. Mark said that after they had had a smoke, the woman got out of the car and walked off with said gingerhead man. He likely didn't expect the police to confirm that they had already questioned the mysterious redhead and ruled him out of their inquiries. Mark said in reply, He can't be. He was the last man to see her, not me. Despite his claims of the woman only being in the car for, quote, as long as it takes to smoke a cigarette, Mark was held on remand to await his trial. No application for bail was made. The trial began at Cardiff Crown Court in October 2000 and lasted 42 days, with it concluding a week before Christmas on December 18th. There was a discrepancy in the trial regarding some mud that was found in Mark's car. Professor Kenneth Pye, speaking on behalf of the prosecution, believed it came from the riverbank, indicating there was only a 20% chance it came from another source. Dr. Christopher Jeans, speaking on behalf of the defence, disagreed and said he regarded samples taken from the riverbank and from the car seat to be a mismatch. During his testimony, Mark's attempts to further attack the character of Rebecca continued. He explained that she had approached him in his car to purchase drugs and the two had ended up sharing a cigarette. When asked why he had initially denied that Rebecca had been in his car, Mark said, I lied because they wouldn't believe me. The police hate me absolutely hate me. I was frightened they would not believe what I said. His confessions to friends worked against him, as they all testified as witnesses to say how he had told them he killed Rebecca. It took the jury, made up of seven men and five women, 12 hours of deliberation before returning with their verdict. They found Mark Shillibier guilty of the murder of Rebecca Storrs, and he was subsequently sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 22 years. Sentencing judge Mr Justice Richard Aikens said, the injuries you inflicted, whether in life or death, showed a depth of depravity which was truly horrific. As he was led away, Mark reportedly shouted, You have made a mistake. I did not kill Rebecca Storrs.
In 2003, Mark wrote a letter to the South Wales Echo whilst in Wakefield Prison. It read, I didn't murder Rebecca and I'll prove who did. I could never do the crime I've been imprisoned for. I will prove who did the murder, not only for myself, but for Rebecca's family and for Rebecca herself. It would be easy for me to curl up in the corner and give in. I can't do that. I will keep working on my case until I'm freed. It's not being in prison that makes me angry. It's the stigma of being labelled a murderer. I have had to question my own sanity a few times. I know what I know, but everybody else keeps telling me differently. People that really know me know the truth. A spanner in the works came in October 2003 when Lord Justice Rose gave Mark leave to appeal his sentence. His argument was that the evidence he gave police was given whilst not under caution, so its admissibility in court was being questioned. Lord Justice Rose also ordered the Criminal Cases Review Commission to carry out a full investigation into the possibility that Kevin Havard, a convicted racist, could be linked to the murder of Rebecca Storrs. Kevin was a judo expert serving time after preying on numerous young women in Bridgend over a 14-month period. He was handed a life sentence in September 2001. Lord Justice Rose wanted to know if Kevin Havard's potential involvement was a sufficiently strong enough possibility to undermine the case against Mark Shillibier. It kind of fell at the first hurdle though, when barristers were asked if Kevin Havard had ginger hair, both sides confirmed that he had brown hair. Mark's counsel, Ian Glenn QC, would say that was an irrelevant point, as Kevin had a habit of dyeing his hair. Clutching at straws comes to mind. By April 2004, the investigation had concluded. Kevin Havard was ruled out as having been involved in the murder of Rebecca Storrs. On April 6, 2004, the Court of Appeal judges rejected the claim from Mark Shillibier that his conviction was unsafe. His request for a retrial was also rejected. Despite all that, the Miscarriage of Justice Organisation, or MOJO, a victim support organisation dedicated to assisting innocent people who are in prison, remained in full support of Mark's appeal, and stated that his legal team was going to apply to have his case looked at by both the House of Lords and the Criminal Cases Review Commission, the CCRC. Representing Mojo, Hazel Curl said, Mark is disappointed that he lost his appeal, but he is pleased there is something in the judgment that allows us to keep moving forward. There are public interest issues that warrant adjudication by the House of Lords. It's all to do with where the defendant's rights lie when they are also a witness. No further information is available after that, so it's safe to assume nothing came of Mark's legal team approaching the House of Lords and the CCRC. I said at the start of this episode there were three timelines to discuss. Here's the third. It starts on Saturday, June 8th, 1996. Melanie Hall was a 25-year-old clerical worker in the orthopaedic department at the Royal United Hospital in Bath. She shared a home in the town of Bradford-on-Avon in Wiltshire, southwest England, with her dad Steve, her mum Pat, and her sister. Steve Hall was formerly the chairman of Bath City Football Club, and Pat was a nursing manager. After successfully gaining a psychology degree from the University of Bath, Melanie had met a man named Dr. Philip Colbaum, who was eight years her senior whilst working at the hospital. On the evening of June 8th, the couple had a barbecue at Philip's house before heading for a night out with another couple. Whilst at a nightclub in the early hours, Philip allegedly stormed off after seeing Melanie on the dance floor with another man. That was at roughly 1am on Sunday, June 9th, 1996. Ten minutes later, Melanie was seen sitting on a bar stool at the edge of the dance floor at Bath's Cadillac's nightclub. That was the last time anyone saw Melanie Hall alive. In connection with her disappearance, Philip was arrested along with 26 other men, but they were all clear due to a lack of evidence. In total, 900 people were questioned, but nothing came of it. The link to this story comes from when the police questioned Mark Shillibier in December 2000 about Melanie's disappearance. They likely asked him about it during his trial. No charges were brought against him, though. The search for Melanie Hall ended in October 2009 when a body was found by a workman in a bin bag near Junction 14 of the M5 in South Gloucestershire. Her body had been burned post-mortem, just like Kevin Moyiddin's had. Melanie's cause of death was confirmed to have been a result of severe head trauma. As he had with Rebecca, Mark allegedly confessed to having killed Melanie to one of his cellmates in early 2000, hence why he was questioned about it at his trial. There was a distinct lack of evidence connecting Mark to the murder, and the cellmate would later withdraw his statement. To date, nobody has been charged with Melanie Hall's murder, and like Kevin Moyidin, her case remains unsolved to this day. And that was the story of British murderer Mark Shillibier. 
Thanks again, Kerry Lloyd, for suggesting that case. Let me know your thoughts about it in the YouTube comments or on social media. If you'd like to support the show on Patreon or donate on a one-off basis via Buy Me A Coffee, you can find the links for each of those at BritishMurders.com. Thank you, Jane Harding, for joining the show's Patreon and for buying me a beer via Buy Me A Coffee. That's it for now. I've been Stuart Blues. This has been British Murders. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time. Cheerio.